Hey, welcome to Meyer Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And I am Kelly. Hey! hey. <laughs> welcome, Kelly. We have a special guest today, Kelly Custer. Um, she has, she's the founder and creative director of Knack Design Studios. And she was gracious enough to come into the studio and share her insights and knowledge about design. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> you sound like an NPR podcaster right <laughs> now. That's what I nice. aspire to, James. That's what I aspire to. I, we have we have very diametrically opposed aspirations. <laughs> James James is the comedic comedic relief in this podcast. I like to imagine. <laughs> right? Yeah. But we're uh, you know, we're three designers now, right? Uh, in the big city, sweating the small stuff. So that's Ooh. that's our that's our tagline. Yeah. Thanks, Graham Wilson. <laughs> he came up with some good ones. Well, thanks for coming in, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And um, you guys don't know how excited I am to finally be on this side of the podcast. Yes. Awesome. Usually, I'm just laughing to myself, <laughs> listening to you guys. Now I can laugh with you. Guys. That's great. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, I guess maybe just to give some some quick updates, you're here for the Cork 77 conference, right? Yep. Okay. And you flew in from Knoxville, correct? That's correct. Nice. And um, I I think we like to just start off with like just giving the people a little bit of backstory about who you are and where where you were born, how how you got in, <laughs> how you got into What's design. What's your social security <laughs> number? <laughs> Credit card number? What's the uh, thing on the, the three numbers on the, the back? Security I need, code. I need that. <laughs> All right, I'll give you a little background. So, uh, born and raised in Michigan. Michigan, okay. Yep. Nice. And uh, actually, I went to CCS in Detroit. Oh, CCS. That's a that's a pretty good school. Yeah, it's a great it's, school. Isn't it like always competing with the art center for number one? Yeah. They have a strong automotive. Well, so that's what I did. Oh, you were in the automotive? Yeah. Yes. You are looking at an ex-car person. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's actually pretty wild because now I feel like I'm a full-fledged product designer, but I graduated with a transportation design degree. Yeah. So, and that's, that was just my dream. I was going to be a car designer. And then I very quickly realized that kind of bores me to death. Really? Well, and I was terrible at it. <laughs> well. <laughs> so there's that. I, first of all, all I know is the first time I saw your sketches, my jaw dropped. Yeah. Because it was, I believe it was at the first Square One conference is where we all met. Mm-hmm. Or where I, where I, I well, met you, Kelly. Yes. Yeah. James came to the second one, and I remember seeing they have like that there was like a gallery of all the sketches of all the presenters, and I remember like walking up to this one picture or this sketch of screwdrivers, mm. and there were like screwdrivers that had the translucent plastic handle, mm. and th- the sketch was so crisp and so clean, and the shadow of the screwdrivers also had that translucent look, so it was like a red handled screwdriver. And then the shadow had that like tint of red, and my jaw was just dropped. I was like, "This is amazing." Thank you. I have to give a disclaimer on that because that was me looking at a Spencer Nugent sketch. Oh. Okay. And I studied it, and then I, same thing. I was right. like, "Oh my god, the shadows have color." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but thank you. Yeah, that was fun. A yeah, I challenge. Have, I have a hard time believing that you were a bad car designer. Yeah, that's what. That's Believe what, yeah, me. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really wild because. Like, if someone asked me my strength now, I'd say sketching. Mm. But honestly, that was my biggest weakness in school. Really? Was sketching. And it was, I can tell you why, because I never practiced, oh, ever. I was, okay. first, I didn't really get the point of school when I was in school. Oh, like, I thought yeah. I did. But, you know, it's until, like, you graduate and you connect all the dots and be like, oh, yeah, I should have been, <laughs> been sketching that whole time. Oh, yeah. Um, but, no, that was my weakness. And, uh senior year I realized that and like for my thesis project it was it was a boat but it was less about the object and more about I decided to do the whole project analog Mm. and I was like I don't want to leave the school being a terrible sketcher and I still wasn't great but that was the first time I like hit the sketching really hard Mm. and it kind of jump-started this like uh getting better at sketching and learning and practicing and stuff did you build a clay model of the boat um, it was a foam model, like a CNC foam model, and okay. then some 3D printed parts. Okay. And then it was like hand sanded like 20 times and waxed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Best yeah. paint job oh, on, yeah. the, on an you ugly boat. You waxed all the hair off the foam? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
But uh, where did the where did the whole inspiration to be a car designer like where did that come from? Yeah, is as, that as like, a kid? Did you love cars? Or? Is, yeah, is that's that a, a good Detroit question. Thing? Yes, in Detroit, yes. You just have like uh, motor oil in our blood. <laughs> um, no, so it made perfect sense to me to be a car designer because so I I always loved cars, just looking at them, like memorizing what they were and just the forms and and I. I don't know, I saw some, like, thing way back in the day talking about how that is a career that's possible. Mm. Um, and then... Wait, do you... I, I don't want to, like, dig too far out because I don't know if you know, but what exactly was that thing? You saw something way back in the day that was like, hey, you can be a car designer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was it? Do you remember? Well, it was actually... This was after I knew about it, but there was a special on, I don't know if it's 60 Minutes or what mm. it was, and they... Here's the thing. I'm a very competitive person. Oh. And one thing that they said that always stuck with me is the probability of you becoming a professional basketball player, you have a better chance of doing that than you do of becoming a car designer. Mm. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Yeah, and I've heard so that well. I thought, oh, that sounds like a challenge. <laughs> um, no, but before that, actually, the first thing that ever taught me about industrial design, it's like the corniest story ever, but I was in science class. And there's this, like, margin in the textbook about stuff you always just skip over. Right. And one day I looked over there for once, thankfully, and there were these, like, two ancient guys on this ancient computer doing CAD. And the Uh. title of it was Industrial Designers. And it was this blurb about what an industrial designer is and what they do. And I'd never heard of that before in my life. Uh. But they basically said it's, like, science plus art. Mm. And I was sold. And then I always... I always, despite all our career classes, they tell you, you know, all the jobs you can be. And industrial designer was never on that list. Right. But I always put other. And I, like, added that in. Wow. Because I knew that that was something that fit all of my passions. That's crazy. Yeah. And then when I found out car designing was, quote, unquote, the hardest thing to do, uh, that's why I went that path. That's really ambitious. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of silly now, you know, like... But I just thought, oh, this is the hardest thing I can do. It has to be the right answer. Yeah. And then now I'm like, I should have got a product design degree. <laughs> well, I, I think you're amazing at industrial design. I don't think it, I think it certainly bled over for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was looking at your resume and I saw that you won a competition for a wheel design. Am I oh, yeah. wrong? No, that's right. Yeah, it was Michelin. So that was our, one of our senior projects or junior year. I can't remember. Yeah. And Michelin would come in and do this whole sponsored project. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I ended up winning that. It's like a car plus a tire. So for me, it was like perfect product yeah. project, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I won that. I was super surprised, but that kind of started turning me in the direction of like, oh, I kind of like this producty oh, thing yeah. here. You're spending more on the tires than the car. Right? I think it's kind yes. of funny right now. We're talking about cars, and there are car a symphony of car horns <laughs> outside. We are in, we are live in New York City, everybody. <laughs> Dead side. <laughs> But um, but yeah, I mean, just this whole notion of you being a bad car designer, I just it just it doesn't uh, compute. But I mean, cars I, are so hard. They, they are, are so they hard. are they are. I hard, just for sure. really like yeah. I just car design to me. I mean, maybe you can shed some light on this because I've seen in your portfolio you have like you've got like a jet ski project mm-hmm. and um, oh, I think I remember that one. And like you know, you've got some transportation design things in your portfolio. Like what? are car designers doing for the most part? Like what, what is that, you know, what is that job exactly? Is mm-hmm. it just a ton of sketching? Is it clay? Is it completely separated out between the two of them? James thinks car designers just like draw lines on flat yeah. panels of metal. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. I can probably not tell you the real answer because mm. I haven't been in industry car design. Mm. But like from what we learned at school and then what I've seen my car designer friends doing, I think they have the hardest job mm. it, because, and my favorite part about being a product designer is, I mean, you start with such a range of ideas, right? Like crazy ideas and hone it all in. They start with like this little tiny window. Yeah. Like, there's only so much you can do, right? But from what I've heard and what I've seen is, I mean, they're, it's actually the designer owns like this car. So they basically, when they're pitching ideas, the studio all competes to win this car idea. So like you're trying to get your concept picked. Mm. So they're sketching like gestural concepts of cars. Is it like a friendly competition? Like is the studio like a a family? 
or I feel like if it was like a, a, a bloodbath of like designers trying to get their designs out there I every don't know. like if that was your career, that seems like a horrible work atmosphere. Yeah, it seems a bit stressful to me. I think yeah. it's fun if you're the guy that's getting picked every oh, other right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a lot like being on the basketball team, you know? It's like I if you're so. sitting on the bench the whole time, it's like that's like not that fun. That's true. Yeah. That's true. But so I think that they all bid for these sketch or the bid for the concepts. If you get picked, from what I've heard, you like stick by that car all the way to the end. Wow. So they're doing like rough CAD modeling and gesturing. I've heard where they're like actually doing some surfaces that get, you know, to the A surface handoff. Yeah. But they're not just doing these willy nilly sketches. They're owning the whole thing and then they're going to the manufacturers and suppliers and, you know, making sure their design is sought all the way through. Right. Yeah. But I think it's crazy because if you see cars on the road, they all look the same. Well, there's like such a nuance right. there of going from like like just a facelift or the next gen of a vehicle yeah. there's so much to consider and to be able to like know what people are going to want in five years yeah it's really wild to me it seems so hard to go from like a 2016 camry to a 2017 camry like how do, right what do you do differently i don't know it'd be such a challenge I don't yeah know. that's why i liked pet toys because no one's designed pet toys so you can easily yeah. Just put any effort in right. and make it something awesome. Is there a particular type of car that like that you saw that you were like, oh man, that's the pinnacle? Ooh. Yeah. Or, What's your favorite? Yeah, but now I'm embarrassed. You, I mean, you, <laughs> oh, you did you're this say like, Prius? oh no, <laughs> oh good, good. We'd have to um, end the podcast. Man, well, Model like, T Ford. <laughs> <laughs> that was my inspiration. <laughs> the, the Flintstones. Um, so I'd say, well, the now I'm gonna f the name up, but um, the XLR. The Cadillac XLR, it's like this really dramatic, crazy car. It was like a concept car came to life. And then really the one that I loved for the longest was when the first... Oh, yeah. Okay, I got the name right. Oh, well, Okay, yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, Yeah. so that, when I saw it, like, this thing is beautiful. It's Mm. kind of... It's got an angular look to it. It's It's got like like a a muscle car vibe mm -hmm. almost. It's like a muscle car plus a sports car with a lot of angles going on. Yeah. So I thought that thing was pretty wild when I saw it. And then when the uh, Cadillac CTS Mm. came out, when I first saw that one, it looked so dramatic. But then now, you know, now they keep pushing it, it looks even more dramatic. But right. I'm noticing a trend here with Cadillac. Is there? Which, that's so weird, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why that's the brand that really impressed me in the beginning. But. Yeah. So is there anything that, like, I mean, maybe I'm jumping too far ahead here, but is is there anything that you took from, you know, going through school, learning car design that you bring into product design that mm-hmm. is maybe dissimilar to a lot of the ways that we approach um, products from, like, learning our process yeah yeah for sure i mean the automotive program was very despite me not doing it was very sketch heavy yeah and um i would argue very focused on styling Mm, yeah you know it's a hot sketch it's eye candy it's all this stuff and that's not what i love now i like the problem solving and functionality and all that part of product design but i understand how if your sketch isn't, you know, looking nice, you're going to lose some viewers, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, despite how depressing this idea is, if you don't have, a, a, you know, a sexy sketch, people aren't going to be drawn in to your page or your portfolio or whatever it right. is. So there's some sort of uh, propaganda there that you have yeah. to, like, lure them in with. I mean, you know, it's it's hard to accept that fact, but we are visual people. Like, mm-hmm. every human visually... It, that's their dominant sense. Right. So we see and we make assumptions whether we know it or not. Right. That make, I mean, it just it's the, the nature of how we live our lives. Yeah. And I think it goes into more than... So it's like, you know, what makes a nice sketch? I think line work, your proper shading, all that stuff. But yeah. I think the biggest thing like with cars is perspective. Mm. This dramatic perspective, the right perspective, you know, where you're looking at the car from, a stance. There's yeah. all these things that you think only apply to cars, but it's a big difference. Even like I'm setting up an underlay or something for sketching over for products. It's like right from the very beginning, it's how am I going to set up the shot to draw someone in? If you just have a cube sitting on a table, it's like, womp, womp. <laughs> you know? But if you make this thing all foreshortened and pointing at your user, all this stuff. So it really, I guess that part of it is the biggest takeaway. Hmm. And then 
all-nighters was my second takeaway. <laughs> it's like being able to just sketch until you die. <laughs> That's good advice. That's good yeah. advice. Yeah, we're still sketching. We haven't died yet, but <laughs> we're getting there. Yeah, I'm sketching under the table right now. <laughs> I'm just waiting to die. Now, 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 Kelly, so you went to CCS, and then mm-hmm. you're, you didn't go straight to NAC Design Studio. What mm-hmm. was your career after graduating? So I went, so I kind of had a decision to make. I, um, there are, so I, <clears throat> I'll back up a second. <clears throat> So in uh, school, I did an internship at Whirlpool, a mm. little bit. So KitchenAid is part of the Whirlpool group, so a little bit in KitchenAid and then some in Whirlpool. Um, and then I had a job at a supplier, automotive supplier, doing like products and whatnot. So I, at that point, was like, do I want to be going into, you know, a, f- a what do you call it, like a corporate job? Or, you know, what's this little thing about consultancies? And I didn't know, like, anything about consultancies. The only thing I knew is one time on my internship, my boss brought me along to go to, like, a meeting. It was at Sunberg Farrar, which is in uh, Michigan. And they're a big name there. They've done a lot of really awesome projects. Um, and I walked in there, I'm like, what is this place? Like, what is this? I felt really dumb now looking back, but I didn't know what it was. And I thought it was super cool. They worked on all these projects all at once. And then uh, also I was at Whirlpool, and there were all these sketches on the wall, like, gorgeous sketches for all of these ideas like what is this and uh, so I made it just a quick decision and I thought like okay I'm terrible at sketching and I have like this <laughs> Kelly says this she's the best sketcher <laughs> no, that it, it was just, definitely better than us just yeah. ask my class oh yeah but it, it took a lot of work after school to get that back up but uh so yeah I've just made a decision that's like what if I go to like design boot camp, which is what I thought of as a consultancy, mm. like work on all these different projects and like hone in all these skills at a very fast pace. And then I can go wherever I want. So to answer your question, um, after school, excuse me, after school, I went to Techna, which is a product design consultancy on the west side of the state of Michigan. They do a lot of medical products. So I went from like art school to watching all of these surgeries mm. and pretending like, you know, I knew anything about the medical world, getting up to speed on that. Um, And I was there about four years, I think. And I didn't plan to do the consultancy thing. I actually, um, I got engaged and we were going to move. And I went on like a million interviews and I started making all these connections. And it just kind of like fell into place where I thought, instead of picking one of these people to work with, it's like, what if I just work with a bunch of them? Right. And I had nothing to lose. And this idea like really excited me of working remotely and just trying to work, you know, as a freelancer and work on multiple projects and yeah. be more be more passionate about my work instead of so so serious about it. So yeah. Yeah. that's what led into NAC. Hmm. Okay. I and I mean, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about like Whirlpool or like the the other studios you were at, did you have any interesting projects at Whirlpool? You say you worked at Whirlpool, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I did. Um, they might sound lame, but they're actually pretty cool. So I did a couple refrigerators. Mm. And by did, I'm you know, it's like intern talk. So <laughs> <laughs> how much I actually did, who knows. Um, but I worked on some dispensers, mm. um, which was interesting. It, yeah, I just learned a ton there. Dispensers a, of what? The refrigerator, like oh, water. Right, so right, front, right. Because that's well, really... That's the, that's the fun part. That's yeah. the best part of it. Right? Yeah, because the rest of it's like a steel, stainless steel box. Yeah. <laughs> and so you work on that. And then the inside, actually, there's a lot going on with like the, the drawers and the right. storage compartments and stuff. Right. And then I did a few conceptual things with KitchenAid. Um, but I don't know if they trusted me enough to put me on the good <laughs> project. <laughs> uh, but yeah, refrigerators. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I have a good buddy, Chris Carpenter, shout out, who works at Whirlpool. Uh, I think he's in the refrigeration unit. And I mean, it seems like, I mean, it, it's so interesting for me to hear about these these different worlds in which people are operating in. Like, I, I just, I've never worked on a project like that. I've never worked on anything medical. Like you were mm-hmm. starting to talk about medical design. I've, I've never worked on anything like that. But I remember early on in my career talking to... A freelancer at Quirky and I was like I don't know about medical design and he was like dude it's the best 
like you like iteration is the name of the game yeah. and like just the amount of user research that you get in there you know i, I mean maybe you can uh speak to that yeah i've done a lot of medical stuff now and it's very interesting for multiple reasons but first of all they have a lot of money yeah and yeah you're right iteration is the name of the game and i, I i've seen both things happen where it's a very quick project not very this doesn't happen often but it's very quick you know and they just throw a bunch of money at it and we do it the right way and boom and but most projects go on forever mm. because in addition to just you know the normal tasks of product design you then i mean they have all everything has to be fda approved right there's all these approvals that have to happen and lots of things are changing in the meantime so it is very interesting um I like it because, yeah, that doing medical projects are, I think, the best chance to get user research in. Yeah. Because, like, how are you going to design a tool for surgery if you don't have any clue how that operation goes? Right, right. And so you go in there and they actually, like, I went to a cadaver lab once where I have my 3D printed prototypes <sighs> and there's three dead guys in the room and you're handing your tools to the surgeon and watching them try them out that's crazy oh, oh my god what? it's Wait. like i'm an art student <laughs> isn't, but, it, isn't it crazy that i feel like designers get this weird job of almost like tacking on to everyone else's job exactly right. you're like a like a micro professional in all these different yeah. worlds or like an intern to like I, I don't know. It's it's so weird. Yeah. And, yeah. And you have to kind of like pick up information relatively quickly, mm -hmm. get a grasp of things. I mean, how many surgeries would you say you've observed? So I think I saw two in person and the rest are YouTube videos. Oh. We do that a lot. I would much rather be like front row center or at least club box seat of, mm -hmm. you know, I, any surgery. I don't know. I think I might get sick if i did that really are you averse to blood no i could i could i could handle it but i don't know if i don't i i think there's a difference between like watching it from far away on a youtube video or something and then like being right there into it is there anything was that, it scary yeah it wasn't scary and i this is probably gross but when you're there in person there are smells involved too oh yeah, yeah so that would make me sick i think <laughs> what kind of smells kelly <laughs> oh dear we don't need to just... are we getting into this <laughs> this is the smell portion <laughs> of the podcast well sneaker phone <laughs> we've actually <laughs> uh, yeah i thought they were joking but when i got there someone said you know the quicker we can do this the better because the bodies thaw out oh. the longer this got they were like frozen oh, right, or something because they're cadavers right Mm, yeah. So you didn't necessarily see any surgeries of like somebody who had come into the hospital mm -hmm. and was getting a surgery done. You were mostly cadavers. Yeah, just like testing and whatnot. The, yeah. The YouTube video showed like a real patient getting a real treatment. Right. Um, yeah. Hmm. I'm sure they don't want me to intervene on a, like, someone's <laughs> life. Here, yeah. try my 3D print out. Oh, no. <laughs> no, but I was, yeah, I was just imagining like just observing at the beginning of the project, like observing a surgery and seeing where there are <clears throat> opportunities for yeah. improvement or, yeah, that's crazy. I, I can't imagine. But it seems, it seems really interesting. It is. And like, had I never done it, I would think it would be really intimidating yeah because you're like oh you know i might mess something up or there's probably like really high level thinking and it's the same process it's the same process same everything they're not coming to you to be a doctor right right they're wanting you to think outside the box and figure out these solutions to the problems that they might be a little too close to or whatever but you know you also can't be a willy-nilly designer that's coming up with all these ideas that will never be implemented right so right it is interesting so you left there to be the willy-nilly designer. <laughs> so well, that's why I am now. <laughs> I, I do want to say, did I read that you worked on a yacht or was that something else? Yeah. So that's what, when I left school, okay. I'm like, eh, no cars, boats. Boats. Mm. So I do, I do, um, so yeah. I think you ran the gamut of industries here. Yeah. <laughs> I know. They Everything I ever read says like, you need a specialty. Right. <laughs> And I, I, apparently I'm just fighting that as hard as I can. Um, no, but that is, like, a passion of mine is boats and yachts. So I've pursued that. I've done a few boat jobs. I did a lot of boats in school. Okay. Um, it's just always, to me, that is, like, automotive styling meets products. Because boats are very interior design-esque. You're designing a room mm. more so than 
a car, right? Or a and vehicle. It's all, it's all custom, right? Because it, it probably much. has a lot of space-saving things in it, unless you're designing, like, Steve Jobs' yacht. Yeah. What kind of yachts did you design? Billionaire yachts? Well, a little of everything. Okay. I did a couple, like, speed boats, so just, you oh, know, smart boats. Boat. Wow. Um, but then a couple tenders, which are, like, the boats that take you to the yacht which are still nicer than anything I'd ever owned. Oh. <laughs> so those are like these little luxurious limos. They're like water limos. Water so limos. So those are cool. Um, but then, yeah, the the yachts, I mean, kind of all over the place. But I think the big yachts I did were mo- mas- bleh, mainly personal projects. Okay. I can't think of one that was like a professional project. In, in these yachts, were you working with a company or did you just have clients reach out to you? How did the, how did the yachts whole, that was actually, besides the personal projects, were there other actual paid different boat projects that you got to do? Yeah, so it was um, a guy, actually a car designer reached out to me and this was like his side hustle mm. or was doing these yachts. And so he brought me under his wing and basically... I worked as, through his studio, we delivered on these projects. Oh, uh, okay. So that was my in because at that time I was fresh out of school. So it's like oh, right, chances okay. of me getting hired just as Kelly right. was a little slim. <laughs> <laughs> That's but so cool, though. pretty fun. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've done a lot of different industries, and now you are full-time on your own consulting. Mm-hmm. And you've built up this, this brand, this studio. Knack Design Studio. Where does the name come from, by the way? I knew you were going to ask. <laughs> so I'm just now starting to think, starting to wonder why I picked the name. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. What? You're just having second thoughts about it? Well, no. So I initially picked it with the idea of, like, I have a knack for this. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But now, it's like, that's pretty conceited. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if that's a good way to do it. Um, so... With the help of my husband, we have restructured it to be NAC for design, as if it's like we're a proponent for design. Oh, interesting. Have you implemented that rebrand yet? Or is it more of like a just how you market it? Yeah, it's it's kind of more of a thought process how I market it thing, okay. but it is that's actually always been the slogan, NAC for design. Mm. Got it. Okay. So it's just in my head trying to trying to switch that up a little bit. Yeah. I don't I mean it's not in the grand scheme of design studios, like smart design, like I don't think that Knack is that. Yeah, I think it's yeah a, a well, fine name. I think. It's and fine. to defend it, it's like I knew when picking a name, name's a name, right? Yeah. Like when you think of frog, you know, I'm me personally. I'm not thinking of like a little green frog. Right. Or apple. Like yeah, who it just would name a, name a computer company a fruit? <laughs> <laughs> like what if it was banana? Doesn't banana. that sound crazy? Yeah. <laughs> and why would anybody call their handle "I draw in receipts" when they never draw oh. in receipts? I mean, <laughs> right. Like what? Like what's that about? It's okay, man. It's okay. You can cry on my shoulder. So yeah, I do like the name. It's just lately I've been like laughing to myself because, uh, but it's a name at the end of the day. Yeah. What was your first project as Knack? Mm. Can you even talk about it? It was one of the yacht projects. Okay. Okay. So actually I was doing it on the side when I still worked at the consultancy. I got permission mm. <laughs> to... uh freelance on the side cool and i knew that wouldn't last long because i'm very much like, i wanted to be um you know respectful and true to the company i was at and then i also was really excited and passionate about the freelance thing yeah and that's exhausting to do both right because you oh, work yeah. really hard all day and then you go home and you try to work for like five more hours and you know you do that so i knew that can only last for so long and then it kind of lended itself like i said once i had to leave the company. I'm like, let's just go all in. Let's do this. Yeah. Huh. I'm curious. What What does your husband do? He's also a designer. Oh. Yep. Oh, so okay. we actually met at CCS in the car program, transportation design. He uh, works at Cirrus Aircraft. So he's an airplane designer. Nice. Whoa. I know. It's Man. a super cool We gig. got land. We got water. We got sky. <laughs> we got refrigerators. We got everything. <laughs> Do yeah. you do you guys ever um, collaborate? We have a couple times. How does that how, go? How does I that feel work? like <laughs> sometimes it can work. Sometimes it. Oh, I don't know. Well, this is so in this whole process. You know, I started out as a designer, and now I'm like more like you guys were just talking about in a previous episode about like being 
a creative director, yeah. you know, kind of running the business. And that's where I'm at now. So when him and I, when we collaborated, I was like, hadn't read my leadership books yet on how to be a leader. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Oh, boy. So I was probably like the worst person to work with. But no, we did a project. It was fine. There's probably something bad about working with your significant other, mm. other because like your reviews and critiques turn into like, you're mumbling. I can't hear you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> then they spiral out of control. Um, but yeah, he's that. And that's why I'm so tempted to work with him because he is super talented. He was right. at Volvo Trucks. Oh, wow. And he was their wow. CAD, one of their CAD sculptors. Yeah. So he is like a whiz at modeling. And he just, I mean, I bounce all my ideas off him anyway. We collaborate a lot on Nick. Um, but yeah, I got to become a better manager before <laughs> <laughs> we can do that again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like that's a really tricky relationship to negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I... But that's so cool. I mean, I like, does he have strengths where you have weaknesses? Like, you know, in, in design? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like a perfect fit because I... I mean, I do everything now, but I would argue my strengths are front end stuff, mm. and his are, you know, that that tr- the CAD transition. Right. So he could a surface something all the way to production, and you know has that side of it. So really, it would be perfect if him and I were two people on the project. Right. But you know, then there's my management. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been? How long has the studio been going? How, so was it recent? When did you start, Nick? No, it's been. Four years. Okay. Um, I think it was 2014. I officially started it as soon as I left my other job. I've got an LLC, and I guess that makes it official. <laughs> and then been doing it ever since. Okay. And I swear it's the best thing in the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, James and I, we're independent. I mean, we yeah. We like to, I mean. Spread the good word. Right. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing, but I mm-hmm. think if you get it right, it is like an amazing lifestyle to live um i do you work from home in in how's your setup like yeah i keep getting these requests for um interns they're asking if they can come intern i'm like unfortunately no because i work next to my bed like <laughs> <laughs> um so it's kind of similar to what you guys have going but no i work out of the house there's i actually have an office which okay. is nice um and that snack but so we have a team there's about Right now, there's about six of us going, and everybody's remote. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, it, I didn't set out to do this, but it's what it turned into. Yeah. And it's like kind of this new age design consultancy. Huh. So, it's turned into what started as like Kelly working on projects with this brand name of Knack. There was, you know, these projects coming in, and I thought it's really silly to say no to these projects. Right. When I know there's so many talented designers I could work with, and, you know, these are great projects, all this stuff. So it turned into, you know, people helping, and then now it's NAC Design Studio. Wow. And everybody works in their own space, on their own equipment, and we collaborate remotely for this project. That's interesting. That's amazing. I would love to hear a little more about this. I mean, specifically for for some of my projects, I, you know, I, I do want to... And I'm sure James does too, like just grow and expand. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can, being an individual, you can only take on so much work. Right. right. So, so how do you work with these designers remotely? Are they all designers or do you have engineers working with you or? Right now they're all designers. And they're, um, are they all kind of independent, kind of like us? And do they take on, pe- on NAC projects like occasionally? Is it a lot of NAC projects? It's, um, so it's. Sorry, I have it's a lot all, of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all very new, okay. and it's always changing. Okay. So it keeps me on toes. Um, but lately, what it is, it's kind of a mix. So my theory is always hire people that are better than you. Mm. This is what I've read, and it's panned out well. Okay. Because, I don't know, you. it does two things. Is One, it makes you really respect who you're working with, mm-hmm. you know, because you're not treating them like you're my... I, you're my minion and I'm the boss. Instead, right. you're like you're truly a team and right. we're all right. working together. So there's that. Um, but it's a mix. So I would say half of the people that work with us, me, us, I don't know, are um, their own entities. So they have LLCs as well. Okay. And 
basically NAC is one of their clients. Right. Mm. So they have clients of their own. And the other half are students. Hmm. And so, which is amazing, because like I said, I could barely get through school trying to like figure it all out. And yet these people now on Instagram not only can do school, but also can do Instagram work and freelance. Like wow. they've got it figured out. Wow. So I'd say it's half and half. And uh, the way I have it set up is like there, I ask them at the beginning of every project, are you available and do you want to help? Kind of like as if they're bidding on the project. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's this very fluid, flexible thing because I figure that's an incentive. If I just treat them like an employee and they have to be working 40 hours a week right. at NAC, right, then right. it's not going to go well. Right. Yeah. How, so how did you begin to form this network? Yeah, like who did you connect with? You said at least students, and how did mm-hmm. you connect with them? Or Honestly, the biggest one has been at Square One. Okay. Huh. The first year I went to that, I'm thinking, I'm looking up, right? Like who can hire NAC? And I'm there, and I'm thinking not only are these, everyone around you is very talented, yeah. But they're, like, nerdy enough <laughs> to come to a conference on the weekend and, like, sketch some more. Yeah. Like, yeah. where are you going to find hey, people? Hey, nerds, like that? you want to work for me? <laughs> yeah, we're, like, we have these super nerds, like, all <laughs> coming together. So that was the first one. And I met a bunch of people there. And you just kind of, like, put out feelers to see. Yeah. It's very, very hard to find good people. Yeah. Mm. Because not only do you need a good sketcher or, you know, good designer, but... They then have to care a lot right? and also be good at communication and trustworthy. It's all these things yeah. that, so it's, I don't know, talking to a lot of people and then, um, you know, it's giving them a chance and seeing how it goes. Yeah. I'm so uh, good. Um, that's, that's kind of amazing. And um, what I'm very disappointed about is I've never been approached to be a part of next year. Me either. <laughs> What's up with that? It's coming. We're very busy and need oh, your help. Man. No, that's awesome. I So you talked a little bit about your Instagram. I think, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just a little bit curious. I, I think your Instagram is a little bit different than a lot of other Instagrams Uh-oh. in the way that you kind of tell a story more. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, NAC, you know, you start a NAC. It's like your personal, personal studio, and then it's expanded, and you've kept this more of a studio look to your Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like it's not you facing the camera saying, hey, what's up, guys? You know, it's very professional. What are your thoughts on that? How do you use your Instagram to connect with people? Good questions. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Sorry, am I I doing the hard-hitting questions? No, that's what I want to answer. What's your favorite color? We brought you here to put you in the hot seat. (laughs) It's getting warm in here. (laughs) Uh, No, those are great questions. Uh... First off, it was like, I I haven't had that page for very long, and I felt really dumb, but it was like, I think now two years ago, I'm like, I used to follow both of you, I still do, follow both of you guys. (laughs) Wait, wait, (laughs) check your phone, check your phone, Nick, does she follow us? And like one day, I'm doing all this work at NAC, and I'm like, should I have an Instagram account? Like, should NAC? Because I had one, but it's terrible. It's like donuts and pizza and stuff. Okay, so you you had your personal account. (laughs) Yeah, and it's really bad. Don't go to it. Um, Anyway, but yeah, it was really stupid. But I'm like, oh, I think I should. And then that prompted the, I did a sketch a day. So year one was a sketch a day for all personal reasons. I'm like, because I was doing all these really tight digital sketches, and I'm like, these are not efficient at all. Mm. I want to be able to do quick pen sketches. Right. So that was, you know, it's scary sharing your work because you feel like it's awful. But that was a year of let's get these sketches up to speed. And then what you see now is my year two experiment. Mm. And, you know, it's kind of some of it's going well, some of it's not. But it is kind of addressing a few things, which is one, you know, as designers, we work on all these projects and you can't show anything. Right, right. By the time you can show it, you don't want to show it. Because right. it's like <laughs> Three years 10 old. years old. Yeah. Like, oh, man. So I thought, what if, you know, I forced myself to do, I'm calling them mini projects. And basically, really cool projects I want to put in my portfolio or in Nax portfolio. And then um, show them in a way that would be like Instagram worthy which is educational and like kind of flashy, tell a story. Right. So that was kind of like a double hitter there. So that's what you're seeing now. And, uh, you know, 
It's going. I think it's working. So I, it's a different approach, but I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. But given the recent discovery that Knack is all of these other designers, mm -hmm. are any of these projects that you're showing, are they collaborative projects or are they just you? So far, they've been just me. Okay. But the idea is they'll be collaborative. Cool. So, so far, how it's been working is I've been trying to position myself as like a visionary. Yeah. Be like, I can be controlling Knack's image online, social media presence, kind of looking at the big picture while we're also running Knack as a studio. Mm. So that's where it's been. Um, I've been, oh. you'll see lately, I've been pretty busy, so it's kind of come to a halt. Um, but then the idea is, you know, we could have the whole Knack team working on those projects. Right. Because the beauty of that is they also want to show stuff in their portfolio. Yeah. And it, I don't like saying, nope, you can't show anything. Right. So yeah. if we're working on this stuff together, we can all kind of have something to show for it. Right. What I really appreciate about the projects that you do as these uh, these side projects, mm -hmm. you know, showing off your skill set, um, is that you will you will come across design firms that are doing these like self perpetuated projects, and everything is just sort of like uh, more or less I would say design porn, like mm -hmm. they're just trying to show the hottest thing, the hot render, yeah. but. What I appreciate about what you're doing is that you're not only showing like the hot stuff, but you're also like tackling really interesting like subject matter mm -hmm. or tackling it in an interesting way. It's not necessarily like, you know, the Bluetooth speaker and yeah. like, you know, right. all of all of the like the, you know, the go to's like. For instance, you had you brought with you the the give hanger, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was a super interesting project when you came out with it. So I mean, maybe you can discuss a little bit about that and the types of projects that you take sure. on. Yeah, I think I actually would say I, by default, go to these like interesting ideas, and then I have to make sure that they're looking nice and they are Instagram worthy. Yeah. So I have this, my husband and I actually have this running list. Every time we spit out any idea, like product idea, I write it down. Mm. And most of them are very, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> but when I come to these mini projects, I go through and pick out my favorites. Anything mm -hmm. that seems to have some worth to it. So this is one of them. And it all started out, so we're talking about the give hanger. Um, it all started out with, we're eating breakfast and... Uh, I saw this guy pick a coat or some person put a coat on the ground mm. just in front of the restaurant. And then like 10 minutes later, I saw a guy come and pick it up. And I'm thinking, oh, no, he's getting his jacket stolen, you know. <laughs> but it was intentional. Mm. They were leaving jackets for the homeless. Mm. And a homeless guy came and picked up the jacket. And I'd seen that before. It's called scarf bombing, mm. where they'll tie scarves to trees. That's funny. I haven't yeah. heard of that. You never heard of it? <laughs> so it's, uh, and I just think that is such a pure and simple gesture. It's like. I have three coats that don't fit me. You don't have a single coat to wear in the middle of winter. Yeah. And it's just so simple. Yeah. Just tie a coat to a tree, right? So then, of course, as a product designer, I'm like, how can I add 3D printing? <laughs> no, how can I make a product that, like, encourages that? First of all, spreads a message, but then encourages people to leave something behind. So that's what this is. Yeah. And so how does it work specifically? You mm -hmm. take, it's 3D printed, so it's... Uh, you can share it online. Anyone who has a 3D printer, you can order it from Shapeways. And you hang it on a stop sign, right? You have these hooks on the back? Yeah, so there's these poles that are in most cities. Um, and they those straight extruded poles with the holes in them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they plug into two of those holes on any sign. Right. And then it's just this fun little hanger. And it's just a hanger. So you can yeah. put your coat on it, and then it has it kind of shares the message. Mm-hmm. Hashtag give, take. Yeah, and so there's also, if you go to that hashtag, you can see all the people that have hung a hanger, taken a picture of it, and then tagged the location. Yeah. Uh. So I'm slowly building this network okay. of basically you find a hanger, put clothes on it, or you hang your own hanger, right? Right. and then tag the location. It, that, it's, <sighs> it's hashtag give, take without, it, it's give without the E. G-I-V, take. Because that's, that's a, another really interesting part about this project is like there's the person who's putting this up on the sign, but then there's all the people that are then using the hanger to put stuff onto it for people to take. Like there's, you know, 
like usually I, I don't know it's uh it's mm. so interesting like there's how, a bunch of users yeah yeah there's multiple users there's the person installing it and there's the people that are using it mm -hmm. and it's sort of this expanding network right um but i i love the, your observation about the stop sign and using those holes like did that like at what point in the project did you come across that yeah that that's like a key moment that defined what the project was, I think. Yeah. So that was probably my weakness because that's where it started. Oh. So my very, like, I don't know, the problem solver me, that was the very first thing. I was like, ooh, it would be really cool if you could put something on that pole. Yeah. And then I had to try really hard to not let that be the final, you know, to not be stuck only on that. Oh. I, there's, a, there's a stigma. I think we had a whole episode yeah. of like, is the first idea bad? But there's also, some, with this project I learned, there's also something to that. It's just an exercise, right? Like, my my style is very systematic. Like, I eliminate all possible, at first I ideate every single idea possible. Yeah. And then eliminate every idea possible, all this stuff. And it doesn't have to be that way. It could be a lot more loose, mm -hmm. especially with a free project, you know? Yeah. Personal project, it doesn't have to be this expansive ideation process so i was like just go with it right and i did my research to make sure these polls existed and that yeah. that was a thing everywhere but i just went with it because i thought it was clever yeah i think it almost goes to this point that you made in i think it was the last podcast the story about picasso and him and him like doing the sketch in the restaurant yeah. and the guy mm. and then saying this will be ten thousand oh, dollars awesome, yeah. you know it's like yeah you know it's like for me to come across, for you to come across the observation about the stop sign is not just like you in a vacuum thinking mm -hmm. of that idea. That's like a wealth of experience of your entire right. life exactly. leading you to that observation. Yeah, it's right? interesting. So I don't know, but it's, it, I love, yeah, I, I love that element of this project. Yeah, I think that was, yeah, it's such a great project. One of my favorites. Yeah. Another interesting project. And I don't know if you had other topics to talk about, but I want to hear about the lollipop. One. Yeah. That was, that was an interesting yeah. one. Yeah. It was like lollipops filled with liquor? Yeah. So my, I'm trying to think of my original direction with that. The thought was just, it's really like this party scene, which is interesting because I'm not that demographic. <laughs> but I was, I was thinking a shot, some sort of mixed drink or a shot that was both the mixer and the alcohol. And I thought I approached it as a branding project. Mm. Like the oh, okay. very first thought I had was like Jack and Coke sucker. And I just like saw the ad for that in, in my head mm. and thought like, oh, that's really cool. And then I'm thinking, you know, gin and tonic and all these brand. I was picturing just the final advertisement before I even started the project. So then I went back and just treated it like a traditional product design project. Mm. And... That one, I can't still figure out how to prototype that. <laughs> <laughs> you need but, to, like, find a person in culinary school that can, like, blow glass sugar. Yeah. I don't know. Then there has to be, yeah, there has to be somebody at a candy company that can figure that out. I don't yeah, know. Do they, they, I mean, they have, I think they have alcoholic candy, I believe. Yeah, they do. Because mm. I, I started looking into yeah. it. I actually, and that's the thing is, it seems like such an obvious idea to me, but most of my research showed that they have boozy suckers or whatever it is. Right. They don't actually contain alcohol. Mm. Like, what's the point? Oh, it's just It just flavored. tastes bad. <laughs> <It> just tastes <laughs> <laughs> For no reason. <laughs> so I, if that's the only thing I could achieve, I think that would be a winner. Okay, okay. But I, mm, yeah, here's where I'm not the benchmark or the demographic is I think that would just taste terrible. Like, I don't actually want to be sucking on a Jack and Coke. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, but someone would. It's a really, right. It, I feel like, yes, people would definitely buy it for sure, like, at a party. It's like a novelty. Like a bar or something. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It is. And it was one of the, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's one of the first projects that you, like, side projects that you took a look at packaging with. Yeah. Like, the packaging was super interesting as well. Like... Was that was that a part of, like, you know, the project from the beginning was like I want to tackle something that, because alcohol is a lot about packaging. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's so many different bottle designs specific to alcohol brands and. Yeah, yeah. and it, it really wasn't, and so the way I frame these projects, like at the beginning, it was 
probably like me right after New Year's, like, what am I going to do with myself for the year? But I framed up this idea of one mini project a month. Mm. And I broke it all down into what that means, like how often I have to post and what I have to do. And I made them just really fast and compacted so that I would do them. Right. Because I figured if you just are like, I'll do it when I can, you're never going to do it. So I framed it up so that I could do 10 projects in a year. So far, I've done five. Okay. <laughs> and the year's almost ending. I was ending. about to say, I was like, wait, so how many? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I have one. Kelly, what are you doing recording with us? You got... <laughs> yeah, it spiraled out of control. <laughs> but the way I had set it up was that, just like really quick, this one month, 30-day thing. And so, no, that one I started, I had this end goal of like that marketing shot. But I just did it like the very, um, I don't know, rudimentary way of first we're going to do research, then we're going to do ideation. And it was through my research that was like, oh, just what you said, a liquor bottle comes in a nice case. Mm. Not like some crazy case, but it has to be packaged somehow. Yeah. And it just played in well with my user story because, you know, if you're going to suck on the sucker for a while, what are you going to do? Set it on the table, like (laughs) at the bar and have it roll around. That's true. So I thought there was an interesting tie there, but it wasn't, it was a short thing. Yeah. I think I had a week to do the packaging. And so, you know, it, I don't know that it needed more than a week, but something quick, but definitely that tie-in that I learned from my research about the liquor industry and all that. Yeah. yeah. So you've done five of these mm-hmm. NAC personal projects. Can you hint at the sixth one, the next one, or no? Or maybe just tell us what, yeah, I can hint what you it. have in the what, – what are the future plans of NAC? I can hint at that. Okay. So – it's going to add yet another industry. <laughs> <laughs> another industry to the list. Submarines, maybe? <laughs> um, <laughs> Spaceships? I, I kind of just want to say Luxury what it is, submarines. but I guess that will kill the hype. Um, no, it's something to do with clothing. Okay. All cool. Of, all of these ideas stem from, like, my real-life problems. Yeah. yeah. So it involves yoga and clothing. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's cool. And is this one that you're going to collaborate with the other collaborators with NAC, or is this still on the personal project track? I think I should collaborate okay. on mm. this one. Yeah. The really beautiful thing about collaborating is when you bake in this room for ambiguity, like the best thing I think that can ever happen is I will give, I try to set up the team for success, right? So I right. give them every possible bit of information I can, and then I just like get out of the way. Yeah. And the best thing that can happen is when they come back, say it's like a stack of sketches, and you're just like, wow, these yeah. ideas are way cooler than I would have come up with, <laughs> and they're beautiful, you know? Yeah. When they, It's great to be surprised by stuff. So that's why it's, it would be nice to work with someone on this, because then, you know, they're going to think of stuff that I can't come up with or don't come up with just because, and uh, it might be some room for delight there. Right. Yeah, I, and I, I kind of want to, like, you know, off of off of what we're talking about here, I kind of like want to make a point. I I've been reached out to before. I mean, we've gotten emails before about people who are trying to do side projects and they're questioning themselves too mm-hmm. much and they're not really starting or they're hitting points where they're like hitting a wall and they can't break through it. And like people starting like, you know, a sketch a day or something like that and they haven't they've like lapsed on a few days and it's like I mean, what would what would you say to a person who is like who is maybe struggling a little bit to get off the ground with side projects? Because like like, yeah, maybe you haven't done a side project every month, but it's still really impressive that you did what five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that is impressive in itself. And like, you know, it's like, you know, oh, well, I got off track. Like just just. Uh, we'll edit it so it says I did a side project every two months. And now you're, now <laughs> yeah, you're on track. There you go. Then it looks like I reached my goals. <laughs> but I, I think there are people out there who want to get into like sort of displaying their abilities through side projects or improving their skills. Like, mm-hmm. do you have recommendations for people like that? Yeah, I think a very easy one is well, first of all, you have to be doing it for the right reasons, right? Yeah. So if you're doing it, to get like you guys talked about this if you're doing it to get followers on instagram it's like that motivation probably isn't going to stick with you very long right if like the sketch a day that i did if i was doing that to get better and that was the whole point i knew because i had done it for 29 years not sketching every day wasn't giving me what i wanted you know so that was enough motivation to actually try to do it 
and it paid off big time. So the, uh, my advice besides that, so first of all, do something for yourself. Do it for a reason that's actually going to motivate you. But a very simple thing that I do every time now is like lay out whatever your goal is. So say like my project or my plan for this year was to do 10 projects. Start at the end and actually plug out this schedule for yourself. Mm. Because I figured out I needed to post two times a week. If I'm not posting two times a week, I'm not doing 10 projects by the end of the year. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And it's it's very hard to chew this big lofty goal. You know, if you were to sit down and say, all right, I'm going to start my first of 10 projects Yeah. versus all I have to do today is page one of the ideation. Right. And lay it out. Like set yourself up for success with this uh, game plan. Yeah. That would be my advice. Cool. Yeah, that's really great advice. Definitely. Yeah. What What do you see as the future of of NAC? Like, do you have do you have a vision for what it what you want it to become? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. No, I don't because I wasn't that long ago. I it was just me. Yeah. And it was never my goal to make. I definitely it won't ever be a brick and mortar. No, you don't think? No, I don't want that. Because I like the freelance esque, the feel of it. Okay. I like the freedom. All the you, you like working in your pajamas. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I have like a 30 second commute from my bed to the office. Um, Yeah, that's the one thing. I don't think it will ever be a brick and mortar. I don't have any plans for it because really the whole goal has always just to been to have to be whatever to be um, an outlet for freelancing or Mm. for doing design work in a very energized kind of way. Mm, Yeah. Okay. And it's just recently turned into kind of this team effort consultancy thing. Um, but no, I, I'm surprised where it's at now. So it's very organic and it's ever moving. Yeah. So I think the goal would just be learn as much as possible and then always take risks and see where it goes. Yeah. That's kind of it. Do you, do you think you'd ever go back to in-house or corporate <sighs> or maybe just full-time design? I don't know what that would be, but yeah. yeah, it's definitely like you guys say, there's pros and cons. Everyone loves to like idealize freelance right and it's hard i think it's fantastic but yeah it's not easy right it's It's not easier or harder it's like its own thing right like scheduling that's (laughs) that is an art form that i am learning like because because yeah like the projects come in and you're like oh my god do i have time to do this (laughs) and like you know i mean it's great that you're building up this network because you see like oh my gosh like i can't take on all this my myself but I'm still kind of interested to see this project through mm-hmm. to some degree, but, uh, but yeah, like, I don't know. There was a moment yesterday where I was like trying to <laughs> just like move the pieces around in my mind of how I was going to get things done. <laughs> oh, no. And it's like, when it comes to like full time, it's like, well, I'm going to go into the office <laughs> tomorrow like I did yesterday. And, uh, yeah, just, like, chip away at it, Mm -hmm. you know. That's the appealing part. Right. Because it is a lot of extra work to, like, navigate the business part of it. Yeah. But I don't know. Some some days, you know, you have the bad days and you think, oh, it'd be great to just go to an office. And, but honestly, at this point, I don't think I could go back. Really? I'm I'm that much of a believer now in... It just makes so much sense in every direction. I feel mm. like all of our listeners are just going to stop going to, to their jobs. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't just... Because everyone's so different. And some people, yeah. it wouldn't go well or they wouldn't like it. Right. But for me, I just love it so much. Yeah. yeah. Sounds uh, corny, but I really do. That's great. I, I have another question. Another quick one, okay. Kelly. So you live and work out of Knoxville. Mm-hmm. And I want to just hear your perspective on living in Maybe a city that's less design centered than New York. I think there's one other designer there. Okay. Oh, there's oh just one, just one. And you guys, Your husband. Yeah. You guys. Oh, yeah. You guys wave to each other in the morning. Oh yeah. So so I mean I think there's people in many different cities mm-hmm. thinking that they have to be in New York to be a great designer or be in San Francisco or be in London, but you know you're in Knoxville and you're creating this awesome this this awesome consultancy and putting out great work. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, because I was listening to your freelance episode and really I wasn't up to speed on the whole New York designer kind of thing where 
you're going on site. Mm. Like, I've done that a few times, but that's not how I primarily work. Right. So, yeah, first of all, it is possible that it becomes all about communication. Mm. Communication is so important to mm. what we do because it's everything. I mean, we're not seeing these clients face to face every day where it's emails and, and not just communication as far as picking up the phone and calling people, but, you know, trying to read their minds and make sure that they don't feel like I've forgotten anything or, you know, that we're going to be late on a project or anything like that. So it's 100% possible. I think it comes to, it's probably a little harder to find clients and, you know, spread the word because no one can see you. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's with today's technology and just how easy it is to work remote, it's not that hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just a little different than what people are used to. Yeah. Have you had any local clients? Yes. So I do have two local clients now, and then I have a few that are like a four-hour drive, actually, in North Carolina. Um, So I will go on site, but it's like for kickoffs or Mm, a couple, you know, like big checkpoints or something. I can't think of a time where I... You know, we're, was going into an office every day for three months or something. Right. Yeah. Huh. And and I guess, like, do you have any just, like, sort of advice? You were talking about communication. Mm-hmm. Are there Were there any moments where, you, like, you learned a valuable lesson about communication with the client? Oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so, so I could see so many thoughts right now. Yeah. Well, actually... Maybe part of the reason I got into this whole, like, hide in Tennessee and have a business thing. It's like, I hate talking on the phone. Oh. Like, a lot. But just recently now, I've totally turned into one of those people. It's like, I'm just going to give them a call. Yeah. Because it just works right. well. Like, there's a reason why people use the phone, right? Yeah. yeah. So I've matured in that kind of way. Okay. Where it's not about, like, Kelly and her comfort zone. You know, it's what does it take to move this project along? Um, but something I've learned, which I think is a great blanket strategy in doing the uh, freelance thing, is just your our main job as freelancers are to is to make the job easy for who we're working for. So either it's making the client look good, or making their day easier, or you know whatever it takes. And that I think goes with the communication because if all day long. You're asking questions and mm. ah, I don't know if I can do this and all this stuff kind of muddying the waters. You're not making it easy for them. Right. But if you're, you know, pleasant to work with and delivering great stuff, like quicker than they could have done, all these sorts of things, why wouldn't they work with you? That is, yeah, that's amazing advice. So I, I don't think of it that way, but yeah, if you make it super easy for the client to work with you. Yeah. No, that's, mm. that is great. And, and I guess... There's one final question, okay. which is, um, like, what are you most excited about going forward with design, with your practice, you know, anything like that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, um, so I've realized in the whole knack thing that, like, the business itself is a design project. And a lot of the business books I've read say that. You're not designing if, okay, so there's, like, the technician, which is us sitting in a room sketching all night. That's a technician. And then there's like the entrepreneur or the visionary. And that's someone looking at high level of the business, where it's going to go and all that stuff. And I'm trying to move into that position, which is hard because I love sketching. But, you know, in that position, it's about designing the business. Mm. And that to me is never in my life would I have said this. Because, like, business is hard and I've never been trained in it. But that's what's really exciting. Because mm. there are huge opportunities there in all these different facets. Whereas if, you know, I'm just sketching at my desk all day, like we said earlier, you can just get busier and busier until you never sleep because you're just sketching all the time. Right, right. So I'd say that's where my excitement is now is, you know, guiding Knack, guiding this team of designers, learning how to be a manager, learning how to run a business, all of this stuff. And just figuring that out, figuring out what knack is and should be. Yeah. No, that's exciting. It's like really nerdy, but a lot of fun for me. Yeah. No, no, that's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Kelly. And I mean, I'm excited to see where Knack Studios goes. I'm, I'm waiting for my email to collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> check, 
check your inbox. It's already there. Hasn't come yet, but uh, we'll, <laughs> one day. One we'll day, check right? back. Is there anything you want to plug? Like social media handles, anything mm. like that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, Knack Design Studio. Yeah, yeah plug the Instagram. company. Right. Anything else or? Hmm. Normal people prepare this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's fine. I mean, you... Um, I do want to plug the project, the Give Hanger. So it's hashtag Give Take G I V T A K E because. It's really designed for the design community. All yeah. of you with 3D printers, you don't know what to print. That bad boy is on Thingiverse. So you can print it for free and then tell all your other designer friends. And we can start putting some coats on people. Yeah. yeah. Warming awesome. up the community. That's awesome. Oh, oh, oh. All right, there we go. <laughs> James just hung it on his uh, microphone. <laughs> I'm going to have to edit some of that. It's actually getting better signal now. Oh, it's yeah. amazing. Flash antenna. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, thanks again, Kelly. And as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. I'm at I Draw and Receipts. All right. I am at Knack Design Studio. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Peace out, guys. Later.